welcome back, everybody. Um, I missed you all. Um, if you get hungry during any part of this, this presentation or others, because I'm sure with food for thought you will, you can always go sneak into the other room and get more food and come back here. Um, but now we have reached the, the keynote portion of our overly packed day, and I apologize for how packed this day is, but we have many reasons for not doing it in two days, mostly because of the sheep. So, um, but anyway, um, I, it gives me really great pleasure, pleasure to introduce Anandita Devanerjee. And if, if we think of our conference and our field in terms of science fiction, then she is queen of, of Mars. Yeah. <laughs> She's our leader. In fact, that's I believe part of what you're talking about today. Um, uh, in addition to being Queen of Mars, she's also Associate Professor of Comparative Literature and a faculty fellow at the Atkinson, De Atkinson Center for a Sustainable Future at Cornell University, and she specializes in techno-scientific cultures, energy humanities, critical geography, media studies, and migration studies across Russia, per Perso-Islamic Eurasia, um, I was better off with Tolkien, I think, and the Indian <laughs> subcontinent. Um, Bergey is the author of We Modern People, Science Fiction and the Making of Russian Modernity, um, winner of, much deserved winner of the Science Fiction and Technoculture Studies Book Prize from the University of California, and the only book in our field that I was that I was reading about on all the blogs I read all the time anyway that are not Slavic, IO9 and so on and so forth, mm -hmm. um, and co-editor of the Paul Grave series, book series, Global Studies in Science Fiction, and her talk today is The Telescope and the Bioscope, Science Fiction Spectacle on the Early Soviet Screen. Mm -hmm. So welcome, Anita. Thank you for um, that very generous introduction, Elliot. I'm privileged to be delivering the lunchtime entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> this gathering of luminaries in Slavic studies, um, who actually, to my delight, and I'm very indebted to them, many of them who have pioneered and continue to nurture work on the rich, um, long neglected, but may I say very, very cool traditions of science fiction and fantasy. <coughs> Thanks again, Elliot, for organizing such a stimulating roundup of speakers. And I'd also like to extend a word of thanks to Heather Jensen for mm -hmm. all her left help with logistics and technical support. So the title of this conference uh, is Radiant Futures. My talk is oriented towards one radiant aspect of the histories of the future, namely the narrow beam of light in a darkened auditorium which uh, in Andrei Tarkovsky's famous formulation was the space where we met our deepest desires, the cinema. The, I also want to thank Elliot for allowing me to be as geeky as I wanted to be. <laughs> so this is the geekiest talk I think of <laughs> So its particular geekiness is embedded in the pleasure of going back to the archives of future making in this space where we meet our deepest desires. <laughs> its spatial and temporal orientations and disorientations, its capacity of fusing familiarity with change and estrangement with its enchantment. This project that I'm about to share with you grew out of my first book, We Modern People, that I did cite it so kindly. Cinema constituted an important element in the complex ecology of genres, media, and discourses in which I attempted to look at Russian science fiction in that book, through which I argued that science fiction was not just a literary phenomenon, but an aesthetic as well sorry, as ideological platform for negotiating a uniquely Russian vision of being, thinking, and acting modern. But I realized even then that science fiction on the screen deserved a sustained study of, of its own which attends to its mediatic specificity, the materials, apparatus, languages, forms, and last but not least, new cultures of spectatorship and configurations of subjectivity generated by science fiction spectacles. What could be more natural, I thought, given the evidence I found on the of the symbiosis between the medium, which in its early days was called the bioscope or light projector all over the anglophone world, and which, as Viktor Shkrosky elaborated, embodied the ultimate conduit for estranging its very object of representation, life itself, and the, uni uh, and the unique affective capabilities of cognitive estrangement, which, according to Dr. Kosuvin's foundational theory, was the promise and premise of science fiction in the modern world. To my surprise, I discovered that beyond Andrei Tarkovsky's Solaris and Stalker from the 1970s, 
and as we will see to a very limited extent, Jacob Protasanus Aelita in recent years, little attention has been paid by scholars in either Slavic or film studies to the spectacular and very large body of science fiction produced on Soviet and Russian screens for the last 100 years. Although this scenario, since the publication of my book, is changing rapidly, I'm very happy to say, including at least one paper at this conference. Um, <clears throat> So the lack of critical attention to science fiction media was all the more surprising to me because some of the boldest experiments in the genre could be attributed to filmmakers who would become canonized via their non-science fiction works as luminaries of Soviet and post-Soviet auteur cinema. They include <coughs> Lev Kuleshov, Vasily Zhuravlyov, who worked with Eisenstein's mentorship, and Pavel Kushansev pioneers of a constantly evolving genre, and of course, uh, Tarkovsky and Ben Gierman, who, uh, Mark, uh, whose film Mark referred to. Um, so the objective of this talk, as it was with my book, is not limited to illuminating an archive or to define its place in, in, in science fiction and or media studies. Um, I want to call for a new critical and methodological approach to science fiction on the Soviet and Russian screen. Instead of ideology, the primary focus of the small body of existing scholarship on a few landmark science fiction films, I want to investigate science fiction media as both an aggregate and an intersection of the screen and its environment. Uh, whether it is the spatial environment of the theater, uh, and in later years, the living room, or most recently computer desks and hands, or the much broader environments in which technological innovations ranging from spectroscopic photography and optical synthesizers to portable tape recorders and coding shape not just cultural production and consumption, but also the very apparatus and materiality of media. I emphasize consumption here, as I do in my previous work, because the study of Soviet culture in general and Soviet cinema in particular has been oriented mostly towards production and uh, sometimes partial views of reception. In contrast, my investigation takes into account the habits and habituses of interactions with the screen, economies of desire, and markets of affect, which I believe generate the surprising convergences between seemingly popular science fiction media of attractions and special effects on the one hand, and revolutionary avant-garde and auteur cinema on the other. Or, as the fledgling enterprise of soft film put it a few years after the release of Jakub Prokozanov's Agita, Kasovoy e Klasovoy Kino. As Ian Christie suggested in his Rana Tech one study on Jakub Prokozanov's Agita, it poses serious challenges to the ingrained doctrine of Soviet cinema's invention ex nihilo during the Civil War's Agit period by, by revealing lines of continuity not only between pre- and post-revolutionary production, but also between the Soviet and Euro-American industries. This is uh, Christie. My intention is to expand Christie's brief contextual provocation to a much broader landscape with a much longer history. And I'm afraid here I'm sitting in front of the screen, but we'll see. As with literary science fiction, science fiction on the Russian screen reveals a codependent but disjunctive relationship with its global counterparts throughout the long 20th century, decentering the geography of special effects dominated by France, Germany, and Hollywood, while being intensely aware of and engaging in close dialogue with them. The flows and disjunctures between Russian and global science fiction media, in turn, disrupt the dual historiography in which Euro-American cinema evolves from early attractions to narrative cohesion, and on the Russian screen, radical avant-garde experimentation gives way under accusations of formalism to a closed industry of, of socialist realist narrative only to be replaced by post-Soviet consumerism. I hope that at least some of these interventions and potentialities will become apparent in the course of my thought that focuses on Agita. So I'll start with a flip.
So I began with this clip because as far as Alita, released in 1924, is concerned, the contradiction that Ian Christie in the aforementioned article pointed out still holds true. Everyone knows about Alita, but few people, or at least people whose testimonies count, have actually seen it. This was just as true, Christie documents, in the 1920s. A film that did exceedingly well with the movie going public nevertheless baffled or plainly in our, the officials, critics, and some fellow filmmakers, including, by the way, Lev Kulishov, who dismissed it in a few phrases as a jumble of images, a point that will be actually central to my presentation later. Then, as it is now, when Alita is routinely heralded as the first Soviet experiment in cinematic science fiction, and indeed canonized as one of the earliest examples of science fiction films worldwide, few people have been exposed to the moving picture visually. The amazing stills of the March scenes with their constructivist sets designed by Isaac Rabinovich and foregrounded by Alexandra Exeter's flamboyant costumes are familiar to anyone interested in avant-garde art. But as John Bolt suggestively argued, these elements are rarely considered within the editor space of the mobile cinematic frame. The scholarly counterpart of this peculiar history of reception manifests itself in the fact that a mention of Aelita is an absolute sine qua non in any discussion of the relations between art, ideology, and everyday life in the era of the new economic policy. Yet the film has remained much more a repository of icons than an artifact examined on its own terms. Its plot and characters provide fertile symptomatic readings for a host of issues outside and around the film itself. Even in the relatively sparse corpus of scholarship that does position the film front and center, among which Christie's elegant analysis of Aida's polyphony is prominent, the fulcrum and focal point remains the turbulent landscape of political and institutional battles against which the movie was made, rather than what takes shape within its frames. Um, in Andrew Horton's reading, for example, the film is an allegory of Russia's domestic political drama, encoded in relationships of gender and power in the politics of private and public life, an interpretation that is also articulated in a very fine brief passage about cross-dressing and gender subversion that Eric Langen included in his provocative work, Sex and Public. The ideological orientation of, uh, uh, of scholarship on Alita is similarly privileged in another thematic approach to the film that crops up in practically every discussion. The peculiar enthusiasm about space flight in Russia that began in the last decade of the 19th century and reached its peak in the 1920s. This is the territory of cultural history, and indeed Richard Stites and more recently Asif Siddiqui have written eloquently about <coughs> Protozano's movie as a spectacular symptom of a fad whose evidence is ubiquitous in popular culture. The same can be said of the many scholarly works that invoke Alita in passing as an example of the obsession with Mars, an endlessly generated geographical other for utopian or dystopian speculation. But how? cinema might have evolved into a particularly privileged site for these fads, or conversely, how the fads translated themselves onto the screen. Um, it remains somewhat unexplored in my opinion. So in order to address these questions, we need to pay attention to the amazing apparatus and the material cultures of visualization that constitute Aida's way of seeing, which in turn determine crucial aspects of the exhibition and spectatorship of this pioneering cinematic experiment. My engagement with the movie that everyone knows about but no one has seen takes place through these two overlapping vacuum. As a scholar who believes that science fiction, cinema, or literature are much more than mimetic representational devices for what lies outside their pages or frames, it is fascinating to observe how their constituent elements also play a constitutive role in shaping and transforming the modes of seeing, being, thinking, and acting encompassed by both ideology and the practices of everyday life. The opening sequence of Alita you just saw, in fact, diegetically on the surface of the screen, inscribes and encodes a marvelous new interface between science spectatorship and subjectivity. My rather utopian objective today is to demonstrate how this interface teaches the audience to how to look, even as it is looking at the film, and to put forward the possibility that their triangular relationship between the eye, the screen, and the machine 
creates a qualitatively new way of picturing the world and imagining the self in relation to it, which is Martin Heidegger's or Orcs definition of modernity at the time of radical <laughs> transition. What is Alita looking through and what is she looking at? A telescope, a movie camera, a projector, or an instrument representing all of them? This question is seldom asked, even within the few consideration of the considerations of the ways in which rocket ships, Mars, and Martians are visualized in Trukazano's film. His audience, though, may have been more perceptive to the Martian princess's ambiguous instrument than we might think. The clip I showed you at the beginning cuts from the opening of the film, which focuses on two kinds of distance-defined technologies. A three-word radio signal, Anta Odeli Uta, is received across the world, but only in Moscow does it elicit genuine interest. Engineer Loss is captivated by its mysterious possibilities and devotes himself to deciphering this mysterious message. The celebration of radio technology, which was also pretty cool in those days, takes place in a laboratory where Loss, whom we see manipulating all manners of esoteric mechanisms and valves with ease, has been trying to construct another kind of fantastical distance-defying machine, a ship that would enable humans to fly to Mars. This exclusively masculine space of the laboratory accessible only to the privileged few who pursue futuristic horizons of transportation and communications is breached by a woman wielding a somewhat less exciting telecommunication device. Loss's work is interrupted by a phone call from his wife, Natasha, who asks him to meet her immediately. So the Mars scene we watched at the beginning now becomes legible as an exact mirroring of its earthly counterpart on another plane of space and time. Nevertheless, even in a much more technologically advanced milieu on Mars, the same rules about environment and identity prevail in much more intensified forms. On Mars, the space of intellectual labor where men pursue the secrets of the universe and construct magical machines has been transformed literally into a hermetically sealed chamber with steel doors and Bohr's invention is deemed so potentially dangerous by Tusku, Alida's father and the ruler of Mars, that he suggests destroying it. The stakes of breaching this space and accessing the knowledge being produced in there are also correspondingly high, whereas the earthly Natasha is content never to step into her husband's laboratory. We see Alida and her maid eavesdropping outside the steel doors, hatching a plan to gain access to the dangerously alluring invention within. And indeed, the Martian princess is not loath to exercise her sexual wiles in order to commit the subversion of looking at and through Bohr's mysterious machine. Once Alita gets through the armed guards and the sealed doors, however, this is what happens. Now I will find that button. Paris to Mars and beyond. Yeah, um, because there's just, um, having done a paper on this myself recently, um, in these French exhibitions, there's also all of these sort of immersive fantastic voyages where you could sort of, you know, go and be surrounded by a panorama of what looked like Jules Verne's, you know, fantastical voyage, which mm -hmm. sounds so much like what you've been talking about here. So it interests me because, you know, I am institutionally a comparatist, um, is um, the kinds of transnational flows and the circuits <coughs> of contact and contamination through which then we can study these phenomena, right? So for me, that is much more interesting um, because uh, both Mark is still not back, but with Mark and Elliot, right? Your one of your points of reference was coloniality, right? And I think Mark specifically mentioned mimicry as a concept. So, so one of the most uh, so postcolonial 
criticism is something that I do quite seriously. And so this is very important also in, you know, the self-construction or self-imagination um, of modernity, right, where you can locate yourself in modernity, both as a temporal concept as well as a cartographic concept of the world. As in people, <coughs> these mediated experiences and images in the post-colonial world were actually much more real. They were very real things, and they enabled people to act in certain ways, to think of themselves in certain ways that are, were much more alive, um, or and maybe they had a kind of an affective force, if you will, in the uh, off-modern, to quote poem, or colonial world that is hard to perceive if you're just looking at it in the industrial Western context, mm -hmm. if I'm making any sense. So one of the my arguments is that in so far as we are still dealing with this orkishness of, of, of placing oneself in the off-modern uh, uh, map, right, that there is a particular um, force to these moments of spectatorship in contexts such as early Soviet Russia, right? Um, that uh, that is not the same as maybe in France, but is also not con confined only to Russia or the, or the Soviet Union, that these things happen in other parts of the world. Sometimes images um, were transmitted also globally in very interesting kinds of circuits that we don't think of normally in the parameters of various studies, but they did as well. I, if one has a question. This is maybe just this hopelessly naive question, just to make sure I understood quite properly. Sorry. Right? Kind of, but is the, um, what was so striking is the difference between the constructivist, like the whole scene mm -hmm. of the Aditha, right? And then when she's looking through that thing, it does, is the, the world that we're seeing is mm -hmm. Hollywoodish, right? Yeah, except right. there are Lumiere brothers, or but they were all over okay. the okay. place. Yes. Yeah. yeah, that's books old fashioned, right? By yeah, <laughs> by <laughs> that is yeah. actually a very fine observation. Yes, indeed. I mean, when you look at these actualities, okay, but they look old fashioned. See, this is the interesting thing about this whole take right. that. What happens if we put ourselves artificially, as in this conference room, in this position where we are kind of looking at this sequence, right? So to us, it looks old-fashioned when we say, okay, this is much more realistic and much less science fiction, right? Mm -hmm. but, but then, I mean, these like scenes of like, accelerated time, right, which are these modern cities, or these, like, mm -hmm. I'm actually quite impressed by those pictures of tanks and armor. These mm -hmm. machines of war that are sublimely huge and advanced and, you know, technologically overpowering, they're almost hyper objects. I can't make that distinction. Because we are experts in avant-garde art, that happens mm -hmm. retrospectively, that particular historicization. It seems to us that the constructivist sets are more forward than uh, that. Right. But if we transport ourselves into the American Hall in 1924, would that be the case? Mm -hmm. Right? So that's kind of <laughs> not a very good answer, but a provocation to think a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. So there was another hand. Well, thank you for a very interesting presentation. I wanted to ask you about the name of this uh, unpleasant tyrant uh, uh, who is called Tusku, right? Mm -hmm. And how does the interpreta interpretation of his name influences your reading of Violeta, if at all? Goodness, I have not even thought about that. It has not influenced my mind. How do you think I, it I don't want to sound like completely obsessed with vampires. And, <laughs> <laughs> you know, oh, you know, <laughs> see, I, no, and I'm so ignorant of vampires. Seriously, yeah, I've never let, you, If you so. let me continue. Uh, the name Tusku, Tusku in oh, Russian Tusku. sounds yeah, exactly okay. like Tusku. In mm -hmm. Dutch, in French, mm -hmm. oh, succubus. Uh, yeah. In okay. Dutch, in French, means vampire. Mm -hmm. 
And it also kind of confirms by the way in which this uh, character is presented and screened in the movie. He looks exactly like vampires. If you look at the early organizations of Dracula, for example, you will see exact parallels and very gothic kind of imagery. They right. exist in this, you know, film which you presented as purely science fiction. So I would argue for an early kind of merging or, you know, early uh, the lack of clear border between science fiction and fantasy, first of all, from the very beginning of the genre. Uh, and um, could I respond to that? Sure. Because um, once again, at the risk of again recommending uh, my book to potential buyers, that's precisely the argument of my book that there is no such thing as pure science fiction, that it is contaminated, it is intergeneric, intermedial. And inter something or the other. There's no reason it's there. I don't remember the whole list. But, but that's, I mean, the joy of studying science fiction is that you don't have to deal with the boundaries of genre. It was never, I mean, no genre is pure in my view, but that's a radical viewpoint. But specifically, science fiction is very nebulous. I mean, it never was a pure genre. I'm interested in the history of science and technology angle of studying science fiction. Frankly, I'm not even interested in, in gatekeeping the boundaries of anything. No, no, science and science I'm, and that yeah, so that that claim was never there. It is nowhere in my work. So no, I just wanted to. And I was that. I was not trying to sort of accuse you of this sort of keeping mm -hmm. the bridging bridging boundaries between the genres. Mm -hmm. What I was trying to sort of. Uh, think about is that if we read the Marsian society as a kind of vampiric society, that puts a very strong uh, doubt upon the whole kind of rational project behind the movie, uh, progressive and so on and so forth. Uh, my other question is about the uh, uh, is about their particular influence on this movie by the avant-garde, especially the Russian avant-garde. Oh yeah, that volumes have been written on it, right? Uh -huh. So the sets, the costumes, actually that's what people study, mm -hmm. the canonical avant-garde you know, influence. Mm -hmm. I study pop to trash. Uh-huh, yeah, I, I was trying to <laughs> no, seriously though, I mean, so, so there is a lot written, including John Bolt, I mean, who is the art historian. Yeah, I was, I was wondering about a particular, you know, your own picture, uh -huh. the one particular shot that you saw uh -huh. uh, looked very much like the rise of the new star. Oh, yeah, 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 all of this has been written about by people much more intelligent than I am. Thank you. <laughs> well, yes. this, oh. oh, sorry. <laughs> no, no, I was going to, is there, there's another comment? I have to wrap things up. Yeah, yeah I'm sorry. Did you have a Yeah, uh, so thanks, thanks for your talk. Um, I just have a, a question about, I guess, the medium of light, right? So you, so mm. you began by talking yeah, about yeah. The, the narrow beam of light that creates the world, and, and it, seemed, it seemed like it was set up Initially, like I said, all or nothing. There's this hermetically sealed space, and then you penetrate into it, and then it's this panoramic vision that opens up, and just the light access vision everywhere. Mm -hmm. but, the, but the medium of film is also a medium of shadow. And in, fact, and in fact, the image is, is one that's created by the, the obstructions yeah. to light, mm -hmm. the obstructions mm -hmm. to vision. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that the, the cinematography of Aivita uh -huh. throughout really emphasizes the role of shadow. You have these exactly. constructivist costumes mm -hmm. that are cast skeletal images across the, the pale bodies in the background, or I was really struck by that uh, image of the, the shadow of the hammer falling across mm -hmm. the sickle that somehow seems to stand uh, in contradistinction with the, the writing of fire that says October 1917. So I, I was wondering if you, could, if you could take a moment to, to flip that negative around and, and, and think about this medium in terms of its darkness and shadow, and not mm -hmm. in terms of the brightness and that stuff. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, no, ab absolutely. That is something that I've thought a little bit about. Oh my God! Excuse me. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but um, <laughs> so, um, 
and the much larger article that hopefully this thing will become one day. Um, I have thought about it, especially because it also seems like I didn't talk at all about the earthly parts of the movie, because there was no time, if I wanted to do justice to this Martian part. Um, so, people are like, okay, so all of this is well and good, but what happens in the humongous like, middle part of the movie, which is all set in the domestic you know, drama or hospital or whatever, and where is the telescope and bioscope there? And which is a very good question and a way to get to you. In fact, the cinematic you find in the boring parts of Arlita in the middle, as always, shadow plays on the wall. So for those of you who have seen it, like that's the picture on the basis of which Rose actually shoots what he thinks is Natasha's lover as a result of which then he has to run away and take on something. So there's a lot, if you look at the earthly parts of the movie, of cinema being reversed in precisely the modality um, um, uh, that you are speaking about as a kind of sh shadowgraphy or shadow play mm -hmm. on the walls, which, by the way, also to address Dina's previous question, is quite gothic. So that's an interesting thing. I don't know if it's rhetoric exactly, but it's gothic. So, so there is absolutely, especially if you do this kind of more structured analysis of the movie, you can totally see mm -hmm. that there is this um, screen of light versus, mm -hmm. you know, the uh, shadow plays, mm -hmm. which is also the boundary line spatially between the Earth and Mars parts of the film. Mm -hmm. So does that answer that question at least partially? Yeah, so, so, and, then, and then also you get, uh, I, I guess, a, 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 a frame or, or enclosed space, like the, the window display, right, the, the between the, 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 that's looked into, so you get kind of a closure of vision on that level. Well. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And also, yeah, I mean, there's a lot to be said on mm -hmm interiors of other kinds, not just the science fictional constructivist one, but the kind of the quasi-imperial ones, you know, they're also very in time, and then you have this shadow play, what do we do with that, etc. So thank you. Okay, actually, I think we're kind of... We I have this job. I hate to cut off the discussion, which has not only been been fascinating and wonderful, but somehow it's conjured Helena um, <laughs> without even looking in the mirror and saying her name three times. She, is, she has arrived. Um, but um, thank you so much for this fantastic keynote presentation. Um, and you deserve many rounds of applause. We're a five, ten minute break, ten minute break, and then we'll go on to the next um, part of our. So this machine turns out to be a device for showing life on our neighboring planet. An observatory is what the closely guarded space certainly turns out to be, but it is also much more than that. It is a movie theater. The machine Gore has invented does not merely show the neighboring planet as an object. It enables Alita to inhabit the spaces of everyday life on it. Through the distance-defying machine that is both a telescope and a bioscope, she is able to first survey in an enthralling loop of moving pictures shot from great heights. Urban scenes teeming with busy streets, tall buildings, flashing electric lights, carrying humans, sublime machines of transportation and war, with a stereotypically orientalized scene of Arab bedrooms thrown in for good measure. Then, <clears throat> in a remarkable move from one Sorry, for one axiomatically excluded from the carefully managed elite realm, which is also, of course, masculine, that turns out to be simultaneously observatory and cinema, 
Alita seizes the control of the telescope slash camera slash projector and zooms in on a couple Los and Natasha framed against a recognizable panorama of Moscow's iconic landmarks. Before considering the significance of the ways in which the telescope bioscope interface performs its dual act of a strange reversal, for Alita viewing life on Earth from Mars and for the earthly voyeurs in a movie theater watching what is putatively their own life unfold on the screen through her eyes, let us consider the space in which Alita's first visual and affective contact with Los is staged. For it is the kiss we learn immediately after the scene that prompted the radio message. In penetrating the secret chamber, not coincidentally aided and accompanied by her proletarian sidekick, the maid Ihoshka, the Princess of Mars perpetrates the revolutionary act of simultaneously democratizing the observatory and the cinema. So the two quotes that you see up on the slides, one from an award-winning Russian science reporter, Vladimir Wittner, at the turn of the 20th century, and the other from a marvelous story by the Polish science fiction writers, cited by Sibyl and earlier and Slavian, written in the year when Sputnik was launched, you will notice, 1957. Mm -hmm. And Lem, of course, as all of you know him, was himself an ardent reader of Russian science fiction, whose Solaris was then uh, adapted for the screen, or not so well adapted, but transposed onto the screen by a Tarkovsky's film. Um, so, so these two quotes together signal the early emergence and lasting significance of a culture of spectatorship in which Alita's mini revolution is deeply embedded. By 1924, Protozano's audience of urban Russians, the cosmopolitan intelligentsia, as well as the middle and working class moviegoers, would be intimately familiar with the conjuncture between the telescope and the bioscope through which outer space had been opened up into a site of democratic pleasure. This site was the astronomical theater in which Wigner lands with a bump from Mars. Astronomical theater, or Kosmicheski Kino, was both the logical culmination and the transformative breakthrough in the burgeoning visual culture of outer space that had begun to transform the subjectivity of the Russian public since the turn of the 20th century. The cosmos was a unique frontier that was completely mediated through the conjuncture between technology and the imagination, and emerged more or less simultaneously with cinema itself. It was also the only space that was not fraught by Russia's self-perception of backwardness or orkishness in the <laughs> rapidly modernizing world of the 20th century. Astronomy was one field in which Russia indeed could claim to be as competent as its European counterparts during the um, Second Industrial Revolution or the Scientific Technological Revolution at the um, turn of the 20th century. The imperial government actively promoted the development of the astronomical sciences, leading to the establishment of three powerful observatories in Moscow, Petersburg, and Kazan by 1901. The extensive press coverage that accompanied each new discovery at the observatories attests to the instrumental role that spectroscopic photography, in particular, played in the popularization of telescopic vision. Hitherto accessible only to a select coterie of astronomers ensconced in the heights of the observatories. Here is an example. Spectroscopic lenses translated nebulous distant objects in outer space into surprisingly clear images. Well, clear for my lifting uh, from microfilm, but very clear actually compared to what came before. Reproduced on the pages of popular magazines such as Priroda Beauty, um, which employed Wittner, these suddenly clear views across unimaginable distances radically changed the reading public's mode of, of locating the self in the world. As close-up images of cosmic bodies reproduced on the printed page brought into the Moscow or St. Petersburg living room, the same intimacies of total estrangement as the privileged confines of an observatory, writers such as Bigner began to use a new set of spatial coordinates to address their readers. Instead of taking the audience's cartographic location as a frame of reference, the size, shape, and speed of heavenly bodies emerged as the standard for representing things on Earth. Thus, the canals of Mars provided the scale against which the Grand Canyon was judged tiny. On the 28th of May, 1900, residents of Kazan were informed that they were precisely 400,000 verse away from the point of view of an individual riding Halley's Comet. 
Opening the pages of a popular science magazine made the reader an instant witness to a sunset viewed from the surface of Neptune. So it's against this backdrop, even though it's an older visual technology, right, of, photog of still photography. So it's against this backdrop of this reconfiguration of spatial subjectivity simultaneously uh, projected onto terra firma and scattered across galactic infinity that we can approach the ways in which the environment and experience of the cinema as well as the cinematic form itself transformed outer space from an abstract concept into a uniquely science fictional immersive experience. Russian Scientific Illustrated magazines in 1899 reported with great excitement that an amazing new concept called the scientific cinema had just arrived in Petersburg. Urania, as this theater was called, this is where Wittner was sitting, completely reverses our perspective on what lies beyond the familiar boundaries of planet Earth. The Petersburg Urania, in fact, was the latest franchise of a pioneering German experiment for transforming the observatory heretofore restricted uh, <coughs> to heretofore restricted as a domain for a few scientists' esoteric intellectual pursuits into a commercialized exhibition space devoted simultaneously to education and entertainment a la Disney's at Fort Pimpa. The Berlin Oranius Society was established in 1888 by Wilhelm Forster and Max Wilhelm Meyer, astronomers and ardent acolytes of Alexander von Humboldt. Following Humboldt's vision of democratizing scientific knowledge, Furster and Meyer decided to establish an institution aimed at educating the general population of folks building project in astronomy. Their stroke of genius was to garner what we would now call venture capital. Mm -hmm. They got from the industrialist Werner von Siemens uh, 200,000 marks, which was a lot of money in those days, to transform the institute into a capacious exhibition space. The German Morania was soon relocated to bigger premises where crowds thronged to experience the scientific theater of the skies. The first year alone brought more than 100,000 visitors and made it an international sensation. Nature magazine devoted a long article to the newfangled popularity of the astronomical theater, advocating its establishment in Great Britain. Soon, new branches of Urania opened in Vienna, Vienna, and the eastern metropolises of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, including Budapest, Prague, and Belgrade. By 1899, when this Petersburg Urania opened to the public, spectroscopy had merged with cinema to create an even more spectacular experience. The Russian branch of Urania enthralled its audiences, among them Wittner, not with lectures and projections of still photos, but whole film strips made up of closely sequenced images carefully edited for continuity. As Wittner's testimony demonstrates, these silent documentaries accompanied as silent films often were by a human orator who transformed the flitting images on the screen, such as this one, into a dramatic narrative, transformed the interface between the telescope and the bioscope into a virtual spaceship and time machine. Bumping back to Earth from Mars or from the unimaginable position in which you were sitting on the moon watching the Earth moving in to eclipse the sun was not surprising given the skills of the unnamed, unfortunately, dramatic spokesperson in the Iranian theater who, as Wittner notes in the same article, was worshipped like a celebrity by the visitors. German institutions, as Christie documents, were also deeply involved in making the protagonists of Protasanos Aida, who all made screen debuts from Moscow's Kamerini Theater into icons of the movie screen. The studio that brought Protasanos and Tolstoy back to Russia to collaborate on Aida was Mezhra Pomkus, an enterprise sponsored by the Berlin-based International, uh, <coughs> International Worker uh, Help Association. So hence, you know, Mezhdu Narodna Rabochev Pomer. German Expressionist Cinema, as many people have noted, uh, particularly the cabinet of Dr. Caligari from 1920, obviously also influenced Arlita cinematography, in particular through the deaf manipulation of lighting. Uh, what this history of transnational production and influence does not take into account, however, is a much wider and older continuum of images that Russian viewers had been consuming at movie theaters, first abroad and then with amazing rapidity in the cinema halls of their own metropolitan cities and provincial towns. 
While Alita's double displacement of viewing Earth from Mars from the nested space of the observatory and cinema dramatically stages the revolution in subjectivity brought about by the astronomical theater about which I was speaking up to this point, what Pratazanov's film, you recognize this is a still from the sequence that Alita projects and watches in, um, um, uh, along with Gore. What Protozanov's film prominently features as an integral part of the additive space of the set used to remain secret from the viewers transported to Mars in the dark holes of the Urania theaters, the projector and its anterior mechanism, the telescope. In embedding this dual technology of the image into the moving image itself, Aylita pioneered a uniquely science fictional self-reflexivity about the intersections between science, spectatorship, and subjectivity. As Garrett Stewart notes later in the 20th century, the visible videographic elements, the projector and the screen within the screen, would become a stock marker of Western science fiction films such as the highly recommended Phantom Empire from 1935 and the Buck Rogers series from 1939. They are really good at science fiction series. I would further argue, however, that placing the telescope bioscope front and center in both the frame and the plot of Radozano's movie also draws the viewer's attention to what the device actually visualizes for both the protagonist and the audience. For superimposed on the expressionist spectacle of the Martian interior are a series of movie clips spliced together, the jumbo of moving images that so irked Kuleshov yet constituted for Protozano's audience, and us for that matter, an intimately familiar, yet profoundly archive, uh, distance archive of the future. What captivates Alida's eye and transforms her eye, draws her into Earth and inserts its drama of life into the very core of her being, is cut and stitched from a series of Lumiere Brothers uh, films, early films that were called Actualites, the earliest movies that attempted to both capture and estrange the movement of everyday life. These great flickering images of cities coming to life with apparently nonsensical scurrying of people and vehicles across their surfaces, the basis for Tom Gunning's seminal theorization of early cinema as a cinema of attractions as opposed to the later narrative depth and coherence that movies would gain from continuous editing, are precisely those that Maxim Gorky, for example, grumpily described as a waste of time in 1896, regardless of having made the effort of visiting several Lumiere shows of actuality and taking the time to write about them. The consequent successes of Lumiere <laughs> films in the Russian market is well documented. But what interests me here is the quality of the particular sequences chosen for Aylita's viewing. The recurring telescopic view um, that asserts the omniscience of the camera. The self-reflexive dimension, this attention to the apparatus, added to the convergence between the telescopic fantasy of space and the bioscopic fantasy of life, seems to me the very template of what Gigaberto, for example, would theorize as Kinopravda, a greater truth generated by the mechanical camera eye converged with the human eye that is much more objective, this transhuman eye, than the imperfect, only or truly human one. And indeed, Looking at the iconic performance of Kino Pravda in Man with a Movie Camera, from which this still is taken from 1929, we see the filmmaker citizen as both astronomer and documentarian. Um, and just by the way, embedding both device and astronomer, filmmaker and viewer, within the frame, within the frame of the film, was also a feature of René Clair's science fiction spectacular of which came out the year after Ailita and did very well on the Russian market. Here you have the Russian poster. So, in contrast with the telescopic projection of, uh, um, of the bioscope stands the obviously constructed scene of Moscow with which Aida's first movie and the familiar structures of life on Mars simultaneously come to an end. Unlike the previous fragments from Actualité, there is a tension between the camera and the viewer's eye in this frame as they look at Los and Natasha's meeting while the frame captures a wide background vista of the Moscow River and the Kremlin from the considerable height of the bridge, the telescopic view, with the requisite hubbub of miniaturized daily life, putting the city emerging from the civil war on the same temporal plane as the capitals of Western modernity, the humans in the foreground are viewed at eye level. In fact, the eye zone zooms in 
to erase the telescopic view and leave in a slightly iris shot an enlarged close-up of the kiss. This kiss, followed by the reverse shot of Aileta, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, creates a direct visual continuum between the three iris, between three irises, so to speak. The telescope, the camera, and the alternative human or Martian eye. And of course, it catalyzes not only Aylita's desire, but also the whole plot of losses flight to Mars accompanied by Yusuf, a working class Red Army veteran who has, I quote, liberated three republics in the East and now feels claustrophobically trapped in the very flow of quotidian civilian life in the metropolis that was depicted on Alita's first screen within the screen. The insertion of Gusev between Alita and her earthly object of desire transforms the telescope-bioscope interface from a vehicle of democratizing knowledge about both the self and the universe into a vehicle of universal emancipation. The cosmic cinema of Mars from the beginning of the movie is the space where all three characters come together towards the end of Los and Gusev's journey. The audience in this instance is not a single individual, but a vast collective of newly liberated slaves from the netherworlds of Tosco's empire. The aristocrat Aylita and the intellectual boss, however, are not the element, active elements in the scene I'm about to show you. What is about to unfold on the screen within the screen towards the end of the movie will be given narrative coherence by the liberator and liberated proletarian Gusev, who literally stands in the spotlight like the celebrity dramatizers of the astronomical theater that Wigner had raved about 25 years ago. Jamesonian utopian space where intellectual and non-intellectual labor symbiotically coexist, or in terms of Leninist dialectics, a space that facilitates the resolution of spontaneity and consciousness. To be sure, the rocket scientist Los is present in the last uh, scene set in the cinema observatory along with Alita, who had incited the Earthlings to release thousands of slaves from the remember works of Mars. Um, but it is the proletarian sidekick Gusev who has liberated three republics in the Red Army, who fulfills the crucial role of voice narrator of the silent film that you have just watched. It is at this moment analogous to the first access to the laboratory, uh, sorry, to the observatory slash projection room, that the telescope bioscope interface becomes an instrument of future making. The interpenetrating borderlands between the telescope and the bioscope are where the fantasy of liberation, as Tights summarized the ideological significance of the Pizanus movie, becomes indistinguishable from the liberation of fantasy. Thank you.